Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Je I'm Jean Messier, and today we're diving back into we're diving back into the fascinating world of home smoke alarm. Now, I have three I have three examples here. One from the night. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are diving back into the fascinating world of home fire alarms. Now, in three previous videos, I covered a number of heat activated mechanical and electrical fire alarms, which were first developed in the late 19th century and were sold well into the 1980s. Now, as I already covered in those videos, these alarms were not nearly as effective as their manufacturers claimed, since by the time a fire gets hot enough to activate a mechanical heat sensor, Levels of smoke, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other combustion products will likely already have reached dangerous levels. And so this led to a number of federal investigations and lawsuits and mechanical heat-activated fire alarms being gradually phased out in favor of more sensitive smoke detectors. And that is the technology we'll be looking at today. So I have three different examples here, one from the 1970s and two modern ones, and these work in very different ways. So Let's dive right in and let me show you how this works. The first alarm I have here is a Vanguard Smoke Sonic introduced by the Interstate Engineering Company of Anaheim, California, a division of Figgy International in 1977. These are the same companies that made and distributed the Vanguard Thermosonic mechanical heat detector alarm, which I covered in a previous video. And indeed, this unit came with a pair of thermosonic alarms with this very 1970s gold dust finish, as well as a user manual. Now, the smoke sonic is what is known as a photoelectric smoke detector, which measures the degree to which smoke attenuates or scatters a beam of light. There are two geometric variations of the system. In one, the light source is lined up with the photocell, and the circuit detects the reduction in light intensity produced by the intervening smoke, while in the other, the photocell is offset from the light source, and the circuit directly detects the light scattered by the smoke. There are also two different scales for this system. For example, detectors intended for use in theaters, auditoriums, and other large spaces will often project a beam across the room to either a detector on the opposite side or a mirror that bounces the beam back towards its source. However, the vast majority of household smoke detectors are of the spot variety where the detection takes place within the detector itself, and that's what we have here. This style of photoelectric smoke detector was patented in 1972 by Donald Steele and Robert Emark of Electro Signal Lab, or ESL, a division of Central Sensor and Control Solutions Incorporated of Carver, Massachusetts. As you can see from these patent drawings, their design was of the indirect or scattering type, with a detecting photocell mounted on a different axis than the light source. It also integrated a number of advanced features. For example, the inside surfaces of the detection chamber are ribbed to minimize light scatter, while a second compensating photocell was mounted at 90 degrees to the light source. This was equipped with a set of lenses that diffuse the incoming light by the equivalent of a 2-10% to light attenuation over one foot of distance. This feature set the smoke density threshold at which the alarm would activate. The smoke sonic is very similar in design, but considerably simplified, likely for cost-saving reasons. Right, so unlike the earlier thermosonic, there are very few markings on this aside from smoke sonic on this ring on the front and an underwriter's laboratory sticker on the back. Also, unlike the thermosonic, this is not tamper-proof. You just undo this slot head screw at the top and the cover comes right off. Inside, we can see three major components, the detection chamber, the siren horn, and a step-down power transformer. The smoke sonic is powered directly from the electrical mains, which has both advantages and disadvantages. On the one hand, you don't need to remember to replace any batteries, while on the other, if the fire happens to take out a building's electrical system, well then, this becomes useless. Anyways, if we further take this apart, you undo these two Phillips head screws on the bottom, and the circuit board comes off the base. The detection chamber is held in place by these two pins, which were originally retained by two pairs of friction collars. However, these were either destroyed or lost in the process of my removing them. Obviously, this was not intended to be regularly taken apart. Now, if I pull this apart, you can see that this is considerably simpler than the original steel embark design. There's no ribbing on the interior, though it is coated with a very low reflective black paint. There's also no separate chamber or lenses for the compensating photocell. Instead, this is mounted directly under the light bulb. Now, I have not been able to find photos of the interior of other smoke sonics, so I don't know whether this flimsy cardboard and electrical tape cover for the light source is original or an improvised repair, though given how ruthless the parent company Figgy International was with cost cutting, I really wouldn't be surprised if it was the former. Anyway, in front of the light source, we have a focusing lens, and across the chamber, a well into which the light beam normally falls. 
And inside this well here, we have our detector photocell, a red light filter, and a spherical plastic diffusing lens, likely to spread the light scattered by the smoke over the entire surface of the photocell. Another interesting feature is this resistor at the bottom of the chamber. Now this is not mentioned in any patents I was able to find, but my best guess is that the heat produced by this resistor creates convection currents that help spread the smoke evenly throughout the chamber. And finally, as you can see here, the wall of the chamber has these scallop cutouts to allow smoke to enter. And that is how a photoelectric smoke detector works. Now, as we'll cover in a little bit, while these are still manufactured today, and indeed in recent years have made something of a comeback, starting in the 1960s and 1970s, photoelectric detectors started being largely supplanted by another technology called the ionization smoke detector, which works in an entirely different manner. Now, the ionization smoke detector was invented by accident in 1936 by Swiss physicist Walter Jaeger, who was trying to develop a device to detect toxic gases, especially in mines. His design comprised a chamber in which air was ionized by alpha particles emitted from a radium-226 source. On either side of the chamber were metal electrodes maintained at a low voltage. The ions of oxygen and nitrogen were drawn towards these plates, generating a weak electrical current. Jaeger believed that molecules of toxic gas would bind to these ions and neutralize them, halting their migration and causing a drop in current that could be electronically detected. However, the device failed to work as intended, and as the story goes, Jaeger, in frustration, lit up a cigarette, and as the smoke entered the detection chamber, it suddenly registered the anticipated drop in current. Now, in 1939, another Swiss physicist, Ernst Melli, built upon Jaeger's research and created a successful ionization chamber device that was able to detect both smoke and toxic gases. And more importantly, he developed a cold cathode vacuum tube to allow the signal to be amplified and the device to be even more sensitive. Yet despite these developments, it wasn't until 1951 that the first commercial ionization smoke detectors for use in factories and other industrial spaces first appeared on the market, and not until 1963 that the first small units for home use were approved by the Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC. And this was largely due to the greater availability of a new, safer alpha particle source, americium-241. Americium was discovered in the fall of 1944 by physicists Glenn Seaborg, Leon Morgan, Ralph James, and Albert Yorzo, who synthesized it by bombarding uranium with neutrons using the 60-inch cyclotron particle accelerator at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley. When uranium-238, the most common uranium isotope in nature, absorbs a neutron, it becomes uranium-239, which then decays twice via beta emission to become neptunium-239 and finally plutonium-239, which is the fissile isotope commonly used in the cores or pits of nuclear weapons. Now, when plutonium-239 absorbs two neutrons, it becomes plutonium-241, which then decays via beta emission to form americium-241 which has a half-life of 432 years and decays via alpha and gamma emission into neptunium-237. Americium was the fourth transuranic element to be discovered by the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory after neptunium, plutonium, and curium, and was named after the Americas, the reason being that it sits directly below europium on the periodic table. It was soon discovered that americium is produced in fairly large quantities as a byproduct of nuclear fission, and indeed one ton of spent nuclear reactor fuel will typically contain around 100 grams of americium. And this can be extracted via an ion exchange process so complicated and resource intensive that Manhattan Project scientists jokingly referred to americium as pandemonium or delirium. Now, this process has barely changed since the 1940s, which accounts for the extremely high cost of americium, around $1,500 per gram. However, the average smoke detector contains only about 0.3 micrograms of americium-241, equivalent to 1 micro curie, or 37 kilobecquerels, aka 37,000 decays per second. Now, in addition to providing a practical application for an otherwise long-lived radioactive waste product, americium-241 produces more alpha particles and less gamma radiation than radium, making it better suited to household use. And in case you're wondering, because of the low penetrating power of alpha particles and the layers of metal and plastic surrounding the source in these smoke detectors, the amount of radiation that actually leaks out of these is lower than the ordinary background radiation, so these are perfectly safe. Now, interestingly enough, many smoke detectors made in Russia actually use a source made of plutonium rather than americium. But unfortunately for all you would-be Doc Browns or domestic terrorists out there, 
the size of the source is typically around 8 milligrams or 18 mega becquerels, meaning you would have to collect around 1 million smoke detectors in order to make a single atomic bomb. Even worse, the plutonium used in these smoke detectors is classified as reactor grade rather than weapons grade because the concentration of the isotope plutonium-240 is higher than 20%. Now, plutonium-240 has a much higher spontaneous fission rate than plutonium-239, which means if you tried to build a bomb out of it, it would experience pre-detonation or a fizzle. That is, it would blow itself apart before achieving any useful nuclear yield. Indeed, the discovery that reactor bred plutonium contains so much plutonium-240 triggered a crisis that nearly derailed the entire Manhattan Project. But that is a story for another time one which I hope to cover in great detail in a video for Today I Found Out, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, in 1965, engineers Dwayne Pearsall and Stanley Peterson developed the first practical home ionization smoke detector, which was manufactured by BRK Electronics and sold under the brand name Smoke Guard 700. This was soon bought up and heavily marketed by Sears Roebuck & Company. Now, initially, these sold for $125 or around $1,000 today, meaning that initial sales were rather slow. However, improvements in electronics technology gradually dropped the price by 80% by the end of the decade. However, improvements in electronics technology managed to drop the price by nearly 80% within a decade, and by 1977, some 12 million ionization smoke detectors were being purchased every year in North America. Sales were further boosted by the National Fire Protection Association, which in 1974 released its first standard mandating the installation of smoke detectors in households. At the same time, the Atomic Energy Commission dropped its licensing requirements for the use of americium 241 making the technology even more widely available. Anyway, I have here a modern ionization smoke detector produced by First Alert, so let's actually open this up and let me show you how it works. As you can see, the circuit board has three main components, the detection chamber, the siren horn, and the detection circuit. If I remove the cover on the detection chamber, which requires me to desolder these two tabs, it reveals the 0.3 microgram or 1 microcurie americium-241 source, which is encased in aluminum cladding with a little window on one end to allow alpha radiation to enter the chamber. Surrounding the source is one of the two electrode plates with the metal body of the chamber cover itself forming the other. As explained previously, alpha radiation from the americium source ionizes oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air, while a mild voltage is applied across the two electrodes. This causes the ions to migrate towards the plates, establishing a weak electrical current. Now, when smoke particles enter the chamber through these louvers on the side, they donate electrons to and neutralize some of these ions, producing a drop in current that can be detected by the circuitry. Now, older ionization detectors will often have an ionization chamber divided into two compartments a reference compartment that is sealed off from the outside atmosphere, and an open main compartment, and the circuitry compares the ion flow between the two compartments. However, more modern versions will just have a single open chamber like the one you see here. Now, as I mentioned previously, starting in the 1970s, photoelectric smoke detectors started being largely phased out in favor of ionization detectors, and the main reason for this was sensitivity. While photoelectric detectors are good at detecting smoldering, smoky fires, ionization detectors are much better at detecting hotter or early stage fires that don't produce a whole lot of particulate matter, which means that they give much greater warning of an impending fire. However, this comes at the potential cost of more false alarms, as anybody who's tried to cook in a kitchen fitted with particularly sensitive smoke detectors can attest. However, in more recent years, photoelectric detection technology has significantly improved, and that technology is starting to make something of a comeback. Indeed, when I went out looking for examples of smoke detectors to show you in this video, around 90% of the units on sale now are photoelectric whereas just a few years ago, the vast majority were ionization type. So I picked up a modern photoelectric smoke alarm, this one made by Kida. So let me take this apart and let me show you how it works. If I disassemble the detection chamber, you can see that this uses pretty much the same architecture as the 1972 steel and MR pattern, with an offset light source and main photocell and a separate compensating photocell, albeit the light sources are now LEDs instead of incandescent bulbs. Now, the system has a number of advantages over ionization smoke detectors, for example, cost. As I mentioned before, americium-241 is very resource intensive to extract from spent reactor fuel, and so photoelectric detectors, which use just standard electronic components, are potentially far more cost effective. There's also an environmental advantage, since the millions of smoke detectors that are thrown into landfills every single year 
will potentially contaminate the soil with a very long-lived radioisotope. Now, one potential theoretical advantage is longevity, since as a radioisotope, americium-241 gradually decays away. But since the half-life of americium-241 is 432 years, and the average lifespan of a smoke detector is between 10 and 20 years, this really isn't that much of a problem. And finally, improvements in electronics technology, particularly LEDs, allow these to use very specific wavelengths of either infrared or ultraviolet light, greatly increasing the detection sensitivity. However, photoelectric detectors are still less sensitive to hotter or early stage fires than ionization detectors, which is why many home fire alarms will often combine the two technologies, along with even a thermal detector, which today these are a lot more sensitive than the old fusible link or bimetallic strip detectors. And some detectors will even include a carbon monoxide detector. However, the workings of that technology is a subject for a future video. Instead, I'd like to end off this video with a funny personal anecdote that is directly related to the difference between photoelectric and ionization smoke detectors. So many years ago, when I was studying engineering at Carleton University in Ottawa, I worked evenings at the Haunted Walk, which is an outfit that gives ghost tours of the city. It was really fun. I got to dress in a black cloak and carry around a lantern and scare the crap out of people. If you're ever in Ottawa, I would definitely recommend you check them out. It's a fun time. Anyway, uh, my first year there, they decided to hold a special Halloween event at the Diefenbunker, which is the emergency government headquarters, a fallout shelter built for the government in the 1960s, which now serves as Canada's Cold War Museum. It's located in Carp, which is just outside of Ottawa. Again, if you're in the area, definitely worth a visit. Now, the conceit of this event was that we were taking visitors back in time to the last day in 1993 when the bunker was in operation. And the whole story we concocted was that doctors were conducting research on humans, on you know making soldiers more resistant to cold, and they accidentally created zombies. Whoops. And so we had... A whole bunch of volunteers dressed in zombie makeup, hiding in corners in the darkened bunker, and we lead people through, and the zombies would come out and scare them. It was a fun time. Anyway, as part of this, we decided to fill the entrance tunnel to the bunker with fog and with stroboscopes, so it would look like this like time machine, the time tunnel. We'd go back in time to 1993. But unfortunately, the smoke machine that they had was rather pathetic, or it was malfunctioning. It was just coughing out just a little bit of smoke, and it didn't fill the tunnel. Thankfully, for reasons that are not important here, I had an industrial fog machine that worked really well. So thinking I was the hero of the day, I brought it in, set it up, the smoke, uh, smoke starts filling the tunnel, and then somebody asks, well, isn't this going to set off the fire alarm? I thought about that for a second, and I thought, well, this is a public museum, they've probably upgraded all the fire detection systems to, you know, modern code, so the detectors are probably going to be ionization detectors, which do not detect vapor all that well. So I think we're fine. So, uh, you know, smoke fills the tunnel, everything is ready. I go out onto the helipad out front and meet my first group. And I'm about five minutes into my opening spiel when I hear a noise behind me, which is a very distant siren. And I think, oh, crap. And before I can react, utter pandemonium breaks out. A whole bunch of people in zombie makeup just start flooding out of the tunnel and like a big puff of smoke and just chaos. And apparently down in the bunker, it was even worse because the fire suppression curtain started rolling down and people were doing the Indiana Jones roll to get under them and get to the exits. Just utter, utter chaos. And we ended up having called the fire department who came in with this big motor driven fan, uh, engine driven fan, it was powered by gasoline, uh, to blow all the smoke out of the tunnel. And they had to reset the alarms and everything like that. And it took about two hours. So we lost a whole bunch of time to conduct tours. So uh, yeah, not my proudest moment, but a very funny memory and a proof that uh, no good deed goes unpunished. So that is my very funny uh, smoke detector story. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another video on our own devices where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices just like these. Uh, in the meantime, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.